Hello everyone, this is a virtual tour of Magmatic Computational Algebra software and it's a video which is part of my mini course on Computations in Number Theory Research which is offered as part of CTNT 2020 which is completely offered online this year. Alright, so let's get started. Magma, as I said, is a um, software package in algebra which allows for computations in algebra, number theory, algebraic geometry, and algebraic combinatorics. It's very robust, it has a lot of functionality, and it's just something very useful for people who are doing computations in number theory in particular. It is uh, distributed by the Computational Algebra Group at the University of Sydney, uh, but it, there are a lot of mathematicians that have made contributions to the code the code base for magma. All right. Um, by the way, um, unlike Sage, Sage Math, uh, magma is not free or open source. However, uh, through the a generous agreement with the Simons Foundation, U.S. educational and scientific research organizations have access to free institutional licenses of magma uh, thanks to this agreement. And uh, this agreement is at least in force until uh, July 31st, 2022. So uh, that's, for example, how I have my license of Magma for my own institution. All right. Uh, even if you don't have a, a local uh, uh, downloaded uh, Magma version in your computer, you can use a calculator that is available online and it's very useful to do computations quickly on a browser even if you are not at your home computer with a powerful machine you can do uh, computations such as 2 plus 3 equals 5 or the log of 2 and uh, compute in magma by the way any uh, links that i'm showing here i will uh, leave uh, links on the description of this video and also uh, the commands that I'm going to be using to showcase Magma to do this virtual tour. I'll have a PDF link also with these uh, commands in my uh, in my page. All right, so let's get started with some uh, little tour of Magma. I have a cheat sheet here just so, uh, so you know. Um, first of all, one can do um, uh, comments in your code uh, like so. Uh, so you can do one line command, one line comments, or multi-line comments with those uh, um, characters. And uh, another thing that is important to know is that, uh, well, uh, lines have to end on the semicolon, and then when you press enter, it compiles and it um, it computes what it needs to compute. Right. So uh, let's start by defining some ranks and fields. Uh, so, for example, we are uh, interested in the in all these um, rings and fields. And that, that's how you define the integers, the rationals, the reals, uh, the complex. By the way, if you uh, there are those uh, parentheses uh, after some of these um, commands because you can put uh, another um, inputs in there to change some parameters to change the. Sometimes you can change. Uh, what rank you get or what field you get. For example, I can change uh, the real field. If I put a hundred here, then now uh, the reals have a hundred precision, a hundred digits of precision. So for example, I can now say what is pi in, uh, in R, and now it gives me pi to a hundred digits. Okay. I can also do, uh, for example, the exponential function uh, but the exponential function it just gives me uh, the exponent the number e to some precision um, so uh, one has to be careful about this so for example if i do log of um, the exponential as a as a real number in uh, 100 digits uh, that will give me an answer which is not one because that it's not doing what you think it's doing um, so if you really want to compute e to 100 digits, then you better call one an element of your real field with 100 digits. So what you were actually trying to do is um, the logarithm of the exponential of and the number one to 100 digits uh, correct. And now we get one, right? So, uh, by the way, any of the commands that you see, if you don't know uh, how to use it, you can always ask Magma, how do I use real field? And it gives me some options. And then I can choose uh, one, and it gives me some more information about how to, uh, what's the real field and how to use it. 
Okay, what else can we use in Magma? We can certainly use uh, finite fields, for example, uh, GF or Galois field of 25 gives me the field with 25 elements. And if I do instead integers uh, 25, then this is not a field, this is the ring uh, Z mod 25, the integers modulo 25. So just so you see that these are different, uh, by the way, when you want uh, an element inside this field, so if I want to know one um, representative of one sixth in the field with 25 elements, I can do uh, this F exclamation point one over six, uh, that is one because six is congruent to one mod five. So uh, one over six is just one. However, modulo 25, if I try to invert one sixth, then that's 21. By the way, we can check that uh, using mods. So this is saying that uh, six times, uh, let's do six times 21 um, mod 25, that is one, correct? All right. Uh, one can use some of the elementary functions in number theory. So for example, the Euler phi function of uh, 25, that's 20. So that says that, for example, 173 to the 20th power um, modulo 25 is one. That is verifying Euler's theorem. All right. I can also uh, define polynomial ranks. So let me uh, copy and paste here. I can define a polynomial rank over the rational numbers and then uh, try to um, uh, factor a polynomial. By the way, what I did there is do a tab. If you start a tab, it, um, if you press tab, it will complete to the nearest command that it exists. Uh, in the database here of commands. So um, now the factorization of x to the 6 minus 1, I can factor that polynomial and it gives me a result. Um, if I factor the polynomial over another uh, rank or another field, then I will get a different answer. So here I'm factoring the same polynomial over the field with 13 elements. Fantastic. I can also uh, define uh, uh, groups of matrices. So for example, here is uh, the SL2 over the integers, a very important uh, group of, for number theorists. And I can uh, talk about A and I can talk about B and I can talk about any uh, combination in the group, uh, such as uh, we can see that these, uh, we can maybe compute a commutator. Uh, like that, so that matrix is a commutator. All right, great. Um, if you want to talk about intervals, so uh, one up to five, that's the interval one, two, three, four, five in numbers. So if I say, for example, okay, what numbers are in the interval one up to five, then there are the numbers one, two, three, four, five. Here, by the way, unlike in Sage, uh, the language in Magma is a little bit more natural. If you don't know Python, for example, uh, as, as is needed sort of in Sage, in Magma, the language is a bit more natural. And for example, lists start with the first element of a list is the first element of a list. Uh, unlike in, Mag in Sage, where the first element of a list is the zeroth element that you have to call here, you would call the first element. So what I mean is that, for example, uh, if I call the primes up to uh, 97, uh, that's a list. So I'm going to uh, uh, call it. Uh, so dollar one is the previous output, and then I can say which, what is the first item in my list? That's number two. Very good. You can also uh, talk about. Uh, lists in uh, intervals of primes. So for example, I can do what are the interval, the primes in the interval from 11 to 100. And I can also do, by the way, random primes. Uh, if I do a random prime 100, what that means is that it's taken a prime that is uh, sort of random in one, um, one definition of random that you can check in the, in the uh, manual. By the way, the manual uh, for Magma, it's uh, pretty nice.
And um, what that this does is that it finds a random prime less than two to the one hundred. That's uh, that's the input that I put there myself. Okay, let me show you how to write a few more lists uh, with magma. So, for example, this list, what it's doing is p. So p, what are p? It's uh, I chose n to be a hundred, and then it's picking the p in primes up to n. So it's primes up to a hundred such that p mod 4 is 1. Um, so this is the list of primes that are 1 mod 4 up to 100. Perfect. All right. Um, other elementary functions that are available in Magma, we can do the divisors of a number, and it gives me all the divisors. We can simply uh, compute the number of divisors. I'm going to complete it with the tab. Uh, just the number of divisors is 12. I can also do uh, uh, the Mobius uh, the Mobius function. Uh, let me compute a few values of the Mobius, uh, Mobius function. And uh, we can also do uh, cycles, like four cycles. So there is, of course, programming in Magma one can do. And uh, here is a function that would start adding the number of divisors of i from 1 up to 10. So that's 27. Very good. One can uh, do this instead of just a for cycle. I could define a function that is going to do this for any n. So for example, this is how you would define a function that does exactly that. For a given n is going to add up from 1 up to n the number of divisors of i um, and then return its sum. Okay, so for example, now I can do some of the, the number of divisors up to uh, 10, and it returns what we calculated before, but now I can do it for any other number, and it will return uh, that function. I can use, for example, also something useful to uh, number theories, the Legendre symbol, the quadratic, um, the quadratic symbol, uh, of Legendre, so the 2 over 7 is telling me, is asking if 2 is a quadratic residue um, mod 7. So it's the quadratic residue symbol of 2 over 7, that's 1. But if I, oh, by the way, an app arrow will repeat, uh, will cycle through commands that I've already used. So if I do uh, 5 mod 7, then 5 is not a square. Of course, if I try to do the same thing but with uh, 2 in the denominator, uh, that's going to give me an error because the Legendre symbol is not defined with a 2 in the denominator uh, below. Uh, but I can, there are extensions of the Legendre symbol, such as the Kronecker symbol, where that is defined. And uh, of course, Magma can compute Kronecker symbols. Other comments that may be useful. Uh, you can uh, check if a number is a square free or not uh, with is a square free. All right. So let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit and start talking about a little bit more of uh, number theory now algebraic number theory. So uh, let me define a number field, an extension of the rationals, which is uh, Q adjoin I. Uh, there it is, and uh, now we can talk about i as the number i that we uh, love, and uh, you can do arithmetic uh, with i, so 3 plus 4i times 3 minus 4i, that's 25. Awesome. I can define the maximal order of uh, my number field. So that's the ring of integers of my number field. And I can call it, and then now I know it's a maximal order. And um, uh, if I try to figure out uh, what are the generators of my maximal order, those are OK1 and OK2. Uh, but magma is not extremely useful in that respect. It just tells me that the first generator is the first generator and the second generator is the second generator. Uh, so you can figure out what are these generators because I can say, for example, is OK1 one? one? Yes. Is OK2? Uh, is it just I? Yes. You can also do, uh, if you don't know what it might be, 
uh, you can find what is the minimal polynomial of OK2. And it gives me this x squared plus 1, so it must be i. I can also compute the discriminant of uh, k, or uh, I can also say what is the discriminant of a uh, of an order, and we'll compute it also. Um, now, one has to be careful with that command, discriminant, because, uh, well, it's typically the discriminant of a number field is defined to be the discriminant of the ring of integers. However, in magma, uh, you see that uh, what happened here is that the discriminant of f gives returns minus 12, but the discriminant of, of q adjoint the square root of, of the discriminant of q adjoint the square root of minus 3 the discriminant of the maximal order is minus 3. So what happens is that by discriminant f, uh, magma is just computing the discriminant of the order defined by the polynomial we're giving to define the number field. So you have to be careful if you want to do the discriminant of the field to really, really um, do the discriminant of the maximal order instead. OK, um, let's define another uh, number field here. Let's do a cubic number field and um, then do some factorization of prime ideals. So I can take uh, one prime ideal, so for example, two times the maximal order, so the, uh, the principal ideal generated by two, and uh, factor it as uh, a factorization into prime ideals of OL. And you see here that two is just um, inert. And uh, you can do this for several primes and see what happens. Uh, so you here, for example, see that 3 factors as a product of 2 prime ideals, but 3, uh, no, no, it doesn't ramify, it's just uh, as a product of 2 prime ideals, but 31 ramifies, while 47 is a product of 3 prime ideals. You can see right away that the fact that 31 has, is there are 2 primes above 31, one that ramifies and one doesn't, that right away should tell you that L is not a Galois extension of Q. Uh, I can check that. Uh, is normal? Is it a normal extension? Uh, no. Uh, but I can check what is the Galois group of L. Remember that L was a cubic, but the Galois group is of order 6, so L cannot possibly be Galois. Great. Um, but so I can compute what is the um, then the Galois closure, and for that you can compute the splitting uh, field of L. Uh, that is one of them, one of one one way of doing this. Or I can go directly and compute the uh, splitting field of the polynomial that defined L. And you see that actually the uh, algorithm is returning two different fields. So let's see what happened in uh, the background. Uh, so I can define A to be the splitting, field of, uh, the splitting field of L and B the splitting field of that polynomial and check that these two, hopefully, uh, these are isomorphic. So I can ask, is A isomorphic to B? Are those two fields isomorphic? Yes. And in fact, it would give me an isomorphism from one to the other. All right, let's pick uh, G to be the Galois group of uh, the field A. And uh, here is G. So it's a, a group of order six. What group of order six? Um, Magma has this very nice feature that you can say group name, and it tells me that it's S3. So it's not cyclic, it's um, S3, it's a symmetric group in three letters. I can uh, then try to do some Galois theory. What I'm going to do is um, compute the subgroups of S, and um, so what, when you compute subgroups, uh, it stores into this uh, data a structure that's called uh, records uh, and then you have to get information out of the record it actually subgroups computes the con conjugacy classes of subgroups so in order to get out uh, the actual subgroups so I can use them you can do for example something like this so this is how you use the command subgroup um, so for H in S for a record in S you can call out uh, the property subgroup and then it gives me 
uh, representatives of those conjugacy classes. All right, let's call this, I'm going to do up arrow and call it this a list. And, uh, and then I can do uh, Galois theory. I can check what is the fixed field of A fixed by the subgroup list one. So the first, the very first group in the, in the list. And it's, uh, it's a polynomial, it's a number field of degree six, since list one is um, the first is just uh, uh, the group of order one, the fixed field is the entire field A. Great. Um, but then I can check what happens with the second element of, uh, of, of the list. Um, let's see. So in the second element of the list, the fixed field is a, uh, it's a group, it's a number field of degree three in the, um, the fixed field by the third subgroup is um, a number field of degree two. All right, very good. Magma can do quite a bit with um, with class groups of number fields. So let's uh, let's take a polynomial, uh, a polynomial ring, and then define uh, f to be x squared plus five. And then I'm going to define uh, the number field x um, q at u under square root of minus five, and its maximal order. I can check that the maximal order is actually generated by 1 and the square root of minus 5. Uh, so let me just check that. Yes, it's generated by 1 and a, where a was the root of x squared plus 5. So the maximal order is q adjoined the square root of minus 5. Um, let's compute the class group of this number field, which uh, we know if you've had a course in algebraic number theory, that this is definitely um, a field or an order with class number two. Uh, so that's that's the group, and this is the class number of the number field. We can uh, look at uh, the class group. So what are the generators of this class group? In magma is not very useful. It just says that the generators is there is one generator. Well, that is something. Um, but it just calls it G1. How do we get what uh, is this generator? What I would like is a generator of the class group. I'm hoping some ideal that is uh, a non-principal ideal that generates the class group. Uh, the way you do that is uh, you see I defined uh, class group. I class group some uh, some commands in magma many commands output more than one output so the first output is the group the second group the second element here is a map it gives me a map from an, uh, uh, um, an abstract abelian group a structure with G the class group the class group is stored as an abstract group it also gives me a map back to ideals so I can uh, talk about ideals and not just uh, the class group as an abstract group so I can actually uh, see what is an ideal that generates the class group so it's an ideal of O with two uh, generators and, and those are generators in terms of the basis of my uh, maximal order so I can I can just see what ideal is this um, it's a, I can compute the norm of this ideal and see that this ideal is of norm 2, so it's an ideal above 2. I can factor uh, 2 uh, times O and see that there is actually just one ideal above 2, so that is the ideal above 2, which ramifies. All right. Um, I can uh, generate other ideals. Okay, in uh, in O, and then see what happens uh, in the class group. So I now the map goes from the class group to ideals. So if I look at the inverse map of uh, of map, is going to go from ideals to the class group. So this tells me that I one that I define an ideal above three. This ideal is uh, not principal. If I try I2, I believe is the ideal above 2 that we had already generated and we already knew it was a generator. And if you do the same thing but with I1 uh, times I2, then this ideal should be principal and it is. All right.
um, by the way, one can look at let's uh, let's look at uh, some number field with a larger class group by, uh, for example, genus theory. I know that the number field Q adjoined the square root of 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 11 times 13 is going to have a large class group uh, just because the two primary part is going to be large due to the number of prime divisors in there which is called Gauss's uh, genus theory. So I can compute G, it computes pretty quickly um, and it tells me that the class group has these many elements uh, how big is it? It's of order 16. By the way, if you want to know how long this took, you can uh, time it. If you do time and a command, it will tell you how many... Um, um, th th that's the ZPU uh, clock, and it took zero ZPU units, uh, which is sort of like seconds. So really, it took almost no time. Um, so I have a group of order 16, and I can check uh, well, if it's, it's a class group, so it's, it's better be a billion. Um, but also, I can check, for example, is it uh, what is the elementary uh, divisors of G? So I know what kind of a billion group I'm talking about. And as we did before, I can check uh, what its group name is uh, the cyclic group of order two to the fourth power. That's uh, the group we're talking about. All right. Let's switch gears one more time a little bit and do some local fields, so uh, p addicts. Um, so I'm going to uh, define the seven addicts and do something with them. So here are the p addict, uh, a p -addict ring. Uh, the prime is seven and the precision is 20. And uh, if you, instead of the p addict, the p addict ring of integers, you want a p addict field, then you can do that too. Instead of piatic uh, rank, do piatic field uh, over uh, the prime seven and precision 20. And uh, I'm going to also define a polynomial rank while well, I'm at it. Uh, polynomial rank over the seven attic numbers. Okay, so um, we can work with seven attic integers. So, for example, uh, a third should be invertible in the seven attics because uh, three is not zero mod seven. And um, this is what um, magma returns. So, magma stores um, p attic integers as an integer that is congruent to my p attic integer modulo, um, in this case, seven to the 20. So, that is one such integer. Um, I think it picks a negative number or a positive number depending which one of the two, um, this one or this one plus 7 to the 20 is smaller in absolute value, we'll pick one or the other just to, to keep uh, the smaller numbers in memory. Um, so uh, now what I can do is do also factorization. So let's check, for example, if um, is, uh, is 5 a... Um, a seven attic integer and no x, x, x squared minus five is actually um, it, it's it's irreducible I could have also checked the roots of this polynomial and that polynomial has no roots in the seven attics but if I do uh, two because two is a square modulo of seven so by Hansen's lemma um, we should have roots, and it does uh, this does give me roots, and the polynomial would factor. Uh, I can do also factorization of other um, polynomials. So for example, if I do x cubed plus x plus five, um, there I also have a hint of a root because um, one plus one plus five is seven is zero modulo seven. So um, we can see that maybe there is a lift of that root that I can get um, using uh, Hansen's, Hansel's lemma. Um, and in fact, I can use uh, Hansel lift. So what is the uh, Hansel lift of this uh, polynomial? Uh, I'm going to lift uh, a root which is congruent to 1 uh, modulo 7, and it finds that root for you. All right? As we said, uh, x squared minus 5 is irreducible, so I can actually extend 
I didn't do extensions for number of fields. Maybe I should have. Um, but let's just do an extension of our local field. It works very similarly. I'm going to do an extension of Q7 by a irreducible polynomial. So here is x squared minus 5. That's irreducible in Q7. So I can extend my field. Um, and now L is uh, the unique and ramified, and ramified extension of Q7, um, which is given by that polynomial. Okay, and then you can do arithmetic in the local fields. So for example, what is a third plus two times a? Um, that is um, that local integer. All right, great. Uh, let's do some um, some arithmetic geometry. So I can um, I can talk about uh, curves. So for example, uh, to talk about curves, one first has to define coordinates. So I have to define my space where the curve is going to live. So I'm going to do, for example, a curve over a finite field uh, to begin with. Um, so the finite field with 37 elements, and then I can define a, a curve um, by First, where is it going to live? It lives in A, and it's the curve x cubed plus y cubed minus uh, 2. So that's a curve, and then I can check, uh, is this a smooth uh, a curve? Um, what did I do wrong? Um, Uh, is smooth. Uh, I guess it doesn't like it over finite fields. We'll do it in a moment over, um, over, uh, over the rationals, and I think it should work. But in any case, um, uh, so I computed the genus of my curve and it told me that it's a curve of genus one over the uh, over a finite field. Uh, I can compute the rational points of uh, the curve and um, because I'm working over a finite field there's only finitely many points and it finds all the points. I can also find the projective closure of my curve and it finds a projective closure. I didn't define the projective space where I want this to live so it gives me some equation defined over some variables that I have not defined so that's what the dollar signs are about. Um, well, as we saw, the P the, or the curve C has a, a genus one. Um, it's actually uh, smooth. I don't, I'm not sure why it's not letting me check uh, the smoothness. It maybe, um, maybe it had to be projective to begin with. I don't know. Um, but I can actually define my. Uh, uh, so if it's uh, this curve is smooth and it has a point uh, one one. Uh, is a point on the curve in projective uh, coordinates. I can define uh, an elliptic curve with that uh, with that equation and that point. So I define in here. I'm defining a projective space of two dimensions. So it's a projective plane, a curve x cubed plus y cubed minus two z cubed, a point one one one, which is uh, clearly on the curve. And once you have that, you can define the elliptic curve CP. What does that do? It actually defines uh, the value stress equation that gives you that elliptic curve with that point. So it gives you a uh, value stress model. So it's actually doing two things. So uh, if I do this instead, then actually it's computing E and it's computing a map from my curve, which is not in value stress equation, to my curve, which is in value stress equation. This is one of my favorite uh, commands in magma, as a matter of fact. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, I had some um, work here to do the set of functions over, fi over uh, finite fields, but let me uh, just go directly into um, more elliptic curves. I'll leave that code in the documents. You can look at how you can, for example, check the verify the, the Riemann hypothesis for, an, for a curve over a, over a finite field. All right, so uh, let me go back to, uh, yeah, I still have my curve here. So here is E in via stress model. I can try to see if this is a minimal model. A minimal model is a model with um, um, 
which is isomorphic over Q, but with the smallest possible discriminant, we see that it, it is not a minimal. So this is a minimal model. So let's call um, this one E instead. And now I have an elliptic curve, which is uh, minimal. And I can compute its J invariant uh, to see what is the J invariant. The J invariant being a number that classifies elliptic curves up to isomorphism over Q bar. And I can, so it's J0, so it's an elliptic curve with um, complex multiplication, by the way. The discriminant of this model is um, that. Um, and I can do has complex, uh, complex uh, multiplication, I believe it is the command. Yes, uh, it has complex multiplication and it gives me the order. It gives me the uh, discriminant of the order that it has complex multiplication by. Okay, um, so it has multiplication by the full ring of integers of q at j on the square root of minus 3. Um, I can compute the bad primes for this elliptic curve. So the bad primes are 2 and 3, and I can check what type of reduction uh, the elliptic curve has at 3. For example, that the reduction, the bad reduction is additive. Um, I can define elliptic curves by their Cremona label. Uh, and in fact, I can query the Cremona database within MACMA. I'm not going to do that, but uh, you can check the, the manual for that. Or I can define elliptic curves by their Weierstrass uh, coefficients. Okay, give the, the same elliptic curve. Um, I can compute the, the torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve. Again, torsion subgroup stores the torsion subgroup as a um, as a abstract abelian group. So if you actually want to find the points that generate the um, the torsion group, then you need some sort of map that uh, torsion subgroup, the, the command torsion subgroup uh, comes equipped with. So uh, T1 is just T1, but if I do um, mappy of T1, then you find the point zero zero is a generator and then now i can define this point to be p and then i can do p plus p i can do arithmetic so that is 2p i can do 3p i can do 4p and i can do 5p and see that i uh, went back to the oh, origin i went back to the zero so p is a uh, point of order five I can also compute the rank of my elliptic curve, and the rank is zero. And true means that um, the computed in the rank is something that is quite hard. And um, what that's saying is that uh, in this case, the rank is actually true one, zero, and that magma can prove that the, that the rank is zero. So, for example, uh, you, one can also compute bounds for the rank, and in this case, the bounds coincide. Um, the rank is bigger than zero and smaller than zero, or bigger to bigger and equal to zero and smaller or equal to zero. So it is zero. Great. One can also compute quadratic twists. Quadratic twists uh, of E. So, for example, I can uh, twist it by two, um, and then uh, compute the um, the rank of this one. Um, it is one. So you see that now the quadratic twist, which is a curve that is isomorphic to E over a quadratic extension, but not over Q, this elliptic curve now has rank one instead of zero. Uh, we can do a quick search for elliptic curves that are quadratic twist of my curve E and see what the rank is. So for example, this uh, code went through the quadratic twist uh, by two up to 20, computed the rank and output to screen, and they're all rank one or zero. Let me do a little um, program that is going to compute uh, the rank up to 100 and it's going to store in memory, instead of putting everything on the screen, it's going to store in memory the largest rank that it finds. Um, so in here, um, it, it started with uh, the maximum rank is zero, the winning twist is uh, whatever, it just like set it to be zero and then started uh, computing quadratic twist and the rank, and if it found some higher rank, then it stored 
the rank and the winning twist. So the winning twist is 58 and the rank of that elliptic curve is 2. So if I twist E by 58, I've found an elliptic curve of rank 2 among the quadratic twists of E. It is not known if whether uh, the rank is bounded as I twist away one elliptic curve. Um, it's uh, it's some a little bit of a controversy of whether some people believe the rank will be bounded or unbounded. Okay, uh, here is an elliptic curve that is uh, well known. Uh, this elliptic curve in the LMFDB is called the Gauss elliptic curve and uh, because it had to do with the resolution of uh, the Gauss class number one problem and uh, this elliptic curve is also well known because it's the first biconductor, the first elliptic curve of rank three. All right. Uh, if you want more information about the model of a group, so I can compute it here. The torsion is trivial and the rank is 3. Uh, the command model of Shy information gives you a lot of information about the rank. So it computes three different things. Um, so what are those things? It's computing um, the rank, the generators of the model of a group, and also um, the structure of, Sha, of the two part of Sha. And in this case, uh, the two part of SHA is trivial, which allows for the computation uh, to finish. Uh, let's see some other um, elliptic curve here. So the elliptic curve 571A1 uh, has uh, some SHA. So now um, if you compute uh, the order of the two part of SHA, um, um, that's probably the dimension that, that is computing, not the uh, not the order of Sha. The order of Sha has to be uh, a square. So, um, but yeah, in any case, it's computing. It's doing a two descent to compute the rank of the elliptic curve, and uh, the rank is um, is zero, um, and the, it's actually giving you bounds uh, on the rank. So the rank is zero, and generators, and then also the dimension of Sha, the two, um, the F2 dimension of Sha, I suppose. Um, okay, so, um, all right. Uh, in the LMFDB, one can get a lot of code that uh, about all the possible um, things that one can uh, ask magma for an elliptic curve. So for example, the conductor of E is 571 and um, I'm not going to do that, but let's, let's try to compute in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, let's try to verify the Birch and Sunderton Dyer conjecture for this elliptic curve. Uh, let's let's go back to perhaps to the um, to the Gauss elliptic curve. So uh, the rank is three. So the um, uh, the uh, Birch and Sunderton Dyer conjecture relates the uh, an order. Uh, of vanishing of an L function to the uh, algebraic rank. So uh, let me define the, um, the L function of the elliptic curve and then I'm going to evaluate uh, this at 1. The vanishing here should be 3 if the Birch and Turner Don Dyer conjecture is true. Um, so um, we're not evaluating E, we're going to evaluate L at 1 and the value seems to be zero. Okay, um, so uh, how can I continue? I can actually take uh, the derivatives. So I'm going to compute the first uh, derivative of the L series and evaluate it at one, and the value is really close to zero. This is not a proof that it's zero, but it looks like it's very close to zero. Let's look at the second derivative. Uh, in the second derivative, at 1 is also really close to 0, and the third derivative at 1 should not be 0, and it's in fact some number that is not 0, it's 10.39 something. So this, uh, if the Birch and Sheridan Dyer conjecture is correct, this should tell me that the algebraic rank is 3, which we know is 3 uh, from the descent. And in fact, the Birch and Sheridan Dyer conjecture tells me that um, that if I compute um, several invariants of the elliptic curve, I can actually compute this value 10.39. Uh, it's 
can be expressed in terms of invariance of the elliptic curve. So for example, um, if I compute uh, all these invariants, uh, so let me, let me just do it in one uh, go. So if I do all of this, so I computed uh, the order of Sha, Sha is trivial, oh, there are the two parts of Sha, but um, in fact uh, all of Sha is trivial in this case, the real period, the regulator, the Tamagawa numbers, and the torsion subgroup, then um, the Bertrand Jones and your entire conjecture says that this number we got uh, when we evaluated uh, the derivative divided by uh, 3 factorial, so divided by 6, should be the same as uh, the order of Sha times omega times the regulator times the Tamagawa numbers times uh, the or divided by the order of the torsion square. And uh, if we do that, oh no, the BSD conjecture doesn't hold for this elliptic curve. No, is because we actually made a mistake. Um, when uh, the omega in the formula of BSD is not quite the real period when the um, real locus of the elliptic curve is disconnected. If it's disconnected, then omega should be uh, twice the real period. So it's twice what I called omega above. And then when I repeat my calculation of Sha, omega, the regulator, Tamagawa numbers divided by the square of the torsion subgroup, then I get exactly uh, the number that I got before as evaluating the um, the residue at one of the L function. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. There is a lot more functionality than one can find in the Magma website. If you go to the documentation in the handbook, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, functionality that one can explore in Magma, and uh, I hope this, this is useful to get people started using Magma in the future. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much and uh, stay healthy.